stated as a theorem. Uh, suppose T is a linear transformation from V to W. Um, we often like to use T to remind you that it's a transformation, a linear transformation. And suppose the dimension of V is N and W is M dimensional. And now the key point is you have to pick bases um, of these two vector spaces. And so you pick a basis of the first one, V1 through Vn, and a basis W1 through Wm of the second vector space. And once you've done that, then the linear transformations from V to W are given by the n by n matrices. And the way you find a matrix corresponding to your given linear transformation, I'll write it this way, is you fill in the columns like this. And the key point is that the ith column of the matrix, which I'm circling here, is the coordinates of t applied to the ith basis vector, which is to say t of vi is this given linear combination of the wj's. And every linear transformation is given by a matrix, and every, every matrix gives a linear transformation. And it's important to note that the matrix that you get depends on the basis. Of course, it doesn't even mean anything to write down a matrix without a basis in mind. So let's look at an example of that. Um, suppose I had a vector space V with a basis V1, 2, and 3, and W a two-dimensional vector space. And suppose that I told you that T of V1 was W1, and T of V2 was W2, and T of V3 was W1 plus W2. Well, then the matrix of this linear transformation looks like this. 1, 0 is the first column, and 0, 1 is the second, and 1, 1 is the third. That is to say, uh, T of 1, 0, 0 is 1, 0. And T of 0, 1, 0 is 0, 1. And finally, T of 0, 0, 1 is 1, 1. So that's just the three uh, defining relations of T that I gave there in matrix form. OK, that's fine. But what happens if we chose a different basis? I want to see how T changes. So suppose I chose a new basis, U1, where U1 and U2 um, were V1 plus V2 and V1 minus V2, and then I just chose U3 to be V3. So in other words, I changed the basis of V, but let's leave the basis of W the same. What effect does that have on the matrix? Well, uh, let's see. What is uh, T of U1? Well, uh, U1 is V1 my, uh, excuse me, V1 plus V2, and therefore I calculate it as W1 plus W2, and similarly T of U2 is W1 minus W2, and T of U3, well, that's just the same as T of V3. That's what it was before, W1 plus W2. And so with respect to this basis, I get the matrix. Well, the W1 plus W2 gives me a 1, 1 in the first column. And the W1 minus W2 gives me a 1 minus 1 in the second. And finally, we get a 1, 1 in the third. So it's important to realize, to be careful what's going on here. This is the same linear transformation. In one basis, it has this matrix, and in the other, it has this. But So it's the same linear transformation, but it's matrix. Uh, you get two different matrices depending on the basis that you choose. OK, so there's an important consequence of all of this. And in some sense, this is one of the main reasons I'm talking about all of this. And it's the following. Every vector space is essentially Rn. And this is an important concept. I'm going to uh, emphasize it here. What do I mean by that, essentially Rn? Well, the point is that the concept of a linear transformation makes this clear and precise. So 
suppose I have a vector space V. Uh, I can choose a basis of it. So let's say V1 through Vn. And now take the, take the usual vector space Rn with its standard basis E1 through En, where, as usual, Ei is the basis uh, is the vector with an i in the i with the one in the ith place. So I'm going to define a linear transformation from my vector space to Rn. Well, simply define it to take vi to ei. I'm allowed to do that. Um, to give a linear transformation between two vector spaces, it's enough to tell you what it is on the basis. And it's clear that t is a one-to-one -one and onto map from v to rn. So you, it sort of identifies v with rn. You identify vi with ei by the linear transformation t. And there's a linear transformation t inverse going in the other direction, just taking ei to vi. And so what this says is that for all intents and purposes, this vector space really can be thought of as rn. It's in bijection with it. You can identify it in, a, in, a, in an elementary way. OK, this is sufficiently important that I want to say it as a theorem. Suppose v is a vector space, and its dimension is n. Let's uh, choose a basis v1 through vn of this vector space. Then there is a one-to-one -one onto uh, linear map, or linear transformation, t mapping v to rn. And it's determined by saying that vi goes to ei. And we say that v is isomorphic to rn. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we can really think of v as being rn. So that's what I mean by saying that every vector space, so to speak, is Rn. But it's really important to keep in mind that when we identify it, the identification of this vector space with Rn depends on the choice of basis of V. OK, let's look at an example of all of this. Go back to the example way back at the beginning of the today's video. Let's take this vector space v consisting of the vectors in R3 whose coordinates add up to 0. Um, this has a basis v1 and v2 as indicated. So this is a two-dimensional vector space. So I'm claiming that we can think of this v as being R2. And the way we think of it is we map the vector 1 minus 1, 0 to 1, 0, and 0, 1 minus 1 to 0, 1. That is to say, v1 goes to e1, and v2 goes to e2. So where does x, y, z go? Well, x, y, z is x times this basis vector plus, uh, excuse me, minus z times 0, 1, minus 1. And so, according to the properties of linear transformation, the map takes x, y, z to the two-tuple x minus z. So this is an identification of this two-dimensional vector space with R2. It maps the vector x, y, z, provided the coordinates add up to 0, to the vector x minus z. And this is a one-to-one -one and onto map. So I'm just going to say sort of vaguely the conclusion of all of this, and but this is quite important. Everything we've been talking about Rn, matrices, determinants, uh, um, Gaussian elimination, rho echelon form, and everything we're going to be talking about in the rest of the semester carries over entirely to the setting of an abstract vector space, to any n-dimensional vector space. And the only caveat is that the details of how that happens depends on the choice of the vector space. But 
the sort of big picture, how everything works, is exactly the same. And we're going to be talking quite a bit more about this as we go through the rest of the course. And this is kind of a, an, introduction, an introduction to all of that.